So let's start off with something easy. Favorite country you've ever traveled to? Uh, Northern Italy. Why? Uh, my wife and I went. Uh, I was actually in the bridal party of Dusty Jonas, a former high jumper that competed against Eric. And that, the wedding was in Slovenia because that's where his wife is from. And then we left Slovenia and kind of toured through, uh, started in northern Italy up uh, along the border with Switzerland, worked our way down, eventually down through Rome and, and came back to the States from there. But northern Italy, definitely, it's it's really unique if you haven't been there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Dusty, he, uh, I kicked his butt for a while. <laughs> he competed against me for a year, though. Hmm. About two years when I was in college, 2011. I like, I like Dusty. Yeah. But after that. It was over. I like him, though. It's my guy. It was over, though. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into this thing. So I would say you are a man who wears many hats within USA Track and Field. Can you kind of tell us about the evolution of you and this organization from maybe athletic performances to now serving committees and chairs and roles, et cetera? Sure. Um, I'm kind of the exception to the rule. I was a D3 coach, um, and there's a lot longer story, but I won't bore you with it, but... Um, probably the breakthrough for me outside of D3 was I did a research on the nature of eccentric strength to a jumper and it got, uh, got a lot of acclaim and people kind of were really excited by that. It opened a lot of doors for me. Um, so in the early two thousands, I became the woman's high jump chair Mm -hmm. and then around 2008 or so, uh, I picked up the men's high jump chair in concert with women. And then around the London Olympics, I became men's development chair. So in that case, I oversee the other event-specific chairs. Um, And I held all those roles till 2018 when I stepped down. Um, Unfortunately, the gentleman who succeeded me, uh, gentleman by the name John Green, passed away. And that was right in the winter, early spring, right before Tokyo. And I got asked to come back into my old role, and I accepted, and here I am. (laughs) Back like you never left. Back like you never left. Yes. Uh, rest in peace to the great coach, John, John Green. Um, so, high jump development chair. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you have an affinity and passion for the event. Uh, currently, the state of the men's and women's event, both on a domestic scale and an international scale, is in flux, we should say. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... Um, there is a change in other guard as far as generations of athletes, right? And and we can clearly see that, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, making that change over in between quads, right? Um, what what would you like to see happen from you know a development chair standpoint, an event you know programming standpoint to help improve us going in not only to to Paris and to Paris, but more so going into our next quad in preparation for LA. Sure. Um- well, let's boil it down to something really simple. Dick Fosbury gave us a recipe, and we lost it somewhere. Yeah. In 1968, Dick was a senior at Oregon State, jumps in the Mexico Olympics, jumps 223. 50 years later, you'd be thrilled to have a 223 guy on your college team, right? So in 50 years, have we really moved the performance level beyond where we were? And I attribute it to one major flaw. Uh, Around the year 2000, kind of following after Charles and Hollis had run through their gamut, and those are the two guys that went 240, uh, there became a school of thought in the U.S. where the start point of a high jump approach should be closer to the plant mark or 90 degrees to, to the plane of the bar. And what we've done is we've restricted the ability of the athletes to run in curve Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. At the same time, I would say that the general athleticism of athletes we are getting in the event is down from previous years. I think we've got better gifted athletes Mm -hmm. who don't express that. So I was talking with, uh, you guys know the coach, Bush Mm Exnader. I was talking with him the other day, and I described it like this. I said, we have high school seniors that graduate and they go on to a college. And that senior in high school is kind of like, their parents give them a car for graduation. Mm -hmm. So they go to this town or this town or this town to state you, and that car needs a front end alignment. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, coaches who aren't equipped to coach the event to its technical correctness, instead of doing the front end alignment, they take the V6 engine out and try to put a V8 in. So you got more power, you got more speed, but it's already misapplied. Now it's misapplied 
plus a factor of two, four, six, eight, whatever. Right. And that's a recipe. If you look at the the athletes today, that their, their knees are all wrapped up and they're all crooked and they can't walk a straight line. If you pound on that body in an efficient way, repetitively, there's going to be a price for it. Right. Now, it's obviously limiting performance, but it's also creating an injury profile. So when individuals graduate from college, they're not very sound physically to start. Right. And but the but the the ante go we're in Vegas today the ante at the table goes up when you go elite and go international yeah. we need more performance out of them but they're already a compromised state so how do we get at that so do you think that the answer is introduction to programming and and systems related to technique sooner or you know as it relates to you know maybe clinical you know work from you know, university to university or case by case athlete by athlete or, or what would you think would be a it's multifaceted yeah. i mean it's uh, we need a, a better high school program bringing out kids that are matched to, to closer to what an optimal run would be right and then coaches can build off that the challenge and i i, I don't want to sound like i'm talking down ncaa coaches because I gave a lecture to them back in December in Denver, and I, I explained and apologized, saying, if I'm an assistant high, high jump coach at a Division One school, mm -hmm. I'm not very often the head coach. You know what I mean? The head coach is, you know, Cliff was the head coach, but usually the high jump coach is not the head coach of the school. Yeah, it's rare. So you're going to your head coach, and you want to get scholarship money to give to this guy or this lady, and they come out of high school with a performance, let's say, women – you know, in the 180 to 185 range out of high school, guys come out in the 220 to 223, 224, whatever range. Those are kids that are going to be all American for four years. Yeah. How many head coaches are going to let you go to them and say, Coach, I'm going to need a year and a half to tear apart all the things they're doing wrong, plug in a new motor program, get them consistent with it, and year three, they're going to be a monster. They can contend for a national championship. Now, how many head coaches are going to let you spend a year and a half to two years deprogramming a kid because the return will be two inches, zero. Maybe three inches, when we're already guaranteed that they're, they're in the hunt? Yeah, zero. Right? right? So that's the challenge we face. What's the motivation to actually change what they're doing wrong? Yeah. Outside of trying to jump higher. Yeah. Well, right. but again, if you're jumping off a flawed program yeah. and then you try to jump higher off of that there goes your injury rate right right so how much work and i about to say so first and foremost i just felt like i learned a lot about the high jump and i had no idea about any of that so thank you for that as a sprinter i appreciate it uh that was definitely i'll have some more questions for eric later but transitioning back into some of these usa track and field roles so i know you tried to escape they brought you back like you said, um, but as far as a developmental chair, there's been some newfound responsibilities. They're now on high performance, I believe, as well. And that's not that hasn't always been the case. So could you kind of just talk to us about like your day to day responsibilities and then maybe some of the, the responsibilities you have now being on the high performance committee? Well, uh, in development, to explain the system, what we're talking about is a classification of athlete that falls just short of the tier system or TPP. So the tier system and the talent protection program exist. Those have what are basically objective standards. You either make it or you don't. You're either top 15 in the world, you're not. You're either an immediate post-collegiate with a certain performance level or not. So that's gonna gather up 160 to 170 athletes a year. Those athletes get funded through those sources. Development is part safety net or part the next opportunity for support. So starting with 161 or 165 or wherever those two groups fall off, out to 1,000, we have athletes that want to be funded. They want support. We have a limited pool of money and a whole lot of hands out. Any given year, we fund approximately 70 athletes. Um, I would need to stop here and introduce my cohort who's not in the room with us, but Latanya Sheffield is my counterpart on the women's side. Mm -hmm. um, I've been very fortunate working in, in partnership with her that we do not try to meet gender quotas, that we really try to base it on merit. But the problem is we have a limited amount of money to give out and 
it's a very subjective process. In other words, if we get to say around the 65th person and we're comparing a female triple jumper to a male hammer thrower, how do you determine worthiness between those two individuals? Right. One is 22, one is 26 coming off of injury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, it's a challenge that we really have to work as hard as we possibly can to be above board, ethical, fair, because it is a subjective process. But I mean, those are the constraints. We have a limited amount of money. Our budget usually falls in the, the 350, it's been up as high as I wanna say $600,000 a year. And we can fund typically up to about 70 athletes. Some years it'll be you know 33 guys and 36 women and vice versa. Um, but again, we work really, really hard to ensure that it's a merit-based process and we do the best we can. So as an athlete, if I don't qualify for the tier system and I'm looking for you know, resources, I'm looking for help, can you kind of walk us through that process? Because that's something that athletes actually reach out on, on a regular about. Like, so what's available to me? How, who do I talk to? Is there a timing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, timing that I need to be worried? Or, you know, mm -hmm. Sure. So. Well, the tier, the tier and TPP select themselves, but because they select themselves, we know pretty date certain. For instance, the last World Athletic Rankings tell you whether you made tier or not. Mm -hmm. TPP are the kids immediately coming out of college, first, second year out of college. So we know those names by now, by this calendar date annually. After that, that gives us the rest of the people who potentially could be funded. Um, the system works. I described that I, I work as high jump chair um, as well as being the head of men's development that we have individual event areas covered by individuals. For instance, the throws chair is a guy named Tom Putzkus, former Olympic jab thrower, former Olympic team coach. Um, Brian Yokoyama from Mount Sac is the pole vault chair. So those people are the direct contacts and it's their responsibility to stay in touch with the athletes in their event area and assess over the course of the year performance improvement or decline. Mm -hmm. um, to, to borrow from the late great Duffy Mahoney, we're looking for an ascending performance profile because it should just be a stopgap in development. We want somebody to come in for a year and then make the tier. Huh. We don't want people to camp out in development. We're trying to get people from development onto the national team, and that's our job. So my job, people will say, are you going to the Olympics? Well, not really. My job is to try to get people on the plane or right. to get people that much closer to to that, that, that uh, you know, that... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? That uh, achievement level. Yeah. Um, so, and it'll change from year to year. Um, we typically don't carry people on development more than two consecutive years because if they're not showing improvement after two years, there's somebody else with more more worthiness than right. than them. Um, and then we also have individuals graduating from college every year that don't make tier or TPP. So there's an endless backfill of 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 human capital into the system and we also have people that age out time out and decide to do other things so it's a constant churn but again it, it's really challenging that it's an inexact science how do you determine for instance uh jeff hartwig was the olympic guy and he didn't perform until his like late 20s early 30s yeah, exactly. so how long should he, that individual be supported or i think we can agree that a hundred meter sprinter if they're not flying by age 18, 19, it's not like there's some magic that's going to make them come out of the woodwork at age 26. Versus, well, but versus uh, like Kara Winger took, took however long it took, and she was a development athlete at one point in time. Yeah. So certain event areas actually get more development support than others for various reasons. For instance, we go 40 deep in the men's 100. Do we need three development 100-meter sprinters? Not really. We have an endless supply for better or worse. However, you want to look at that. So we typically don't fund event areas where we have depth. Right. We're looking to develop areas where we don't have depth or areas where we're really, you know, kind of falling short on the international level. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's all part of this stew. We're kind of stirring, trying to come up with a decent meal. And you already touched on it slightly, but and I'm, I know you all are aware. Sprinters, hear me out. You might not know this, but different event groups have different peaks. And I'll say, so does that make things challenging to your point? You know, so throwers and let's say women's pole vault, they'll peak at a later age. So if a kid's coming out of college, that, that appears to be very challenging to try to keep them in a the sport until they can actually be able to reach their peak. So 
how do you all, I guess... Well, again, like I said, it's an inexact science. And so we have to advertise that up front. Yeah. I don't guarantee you that I'm... Uh, I think I'm pretty good at what I do, mm-hmm. but I don't guarantee you I'm infallible. Gotcha. And, I mean, we have situations. I mean, every athlete that's you know chasing the dream believes in themselves. And then you come along and say, well, we don't believe in you. And it, it's that kind of cold statement. You don't say it in that fashion, obviously. But you're challenging their world because they're... I mean, people are struggling to you know pay the rent and right. put food on the table and, and live their lives because they're chasing the dream. And you come along and say you're not going to be able to help them financially. So you know each conversation is different. One of the most challenging one is one where somebody kind of has passed the age, approximate age peak in their event area, and they haven't shown the propensity or the likelihood of, of reaching that yeah. next level. That's a really tough conversation. Yeah. You know I mean... Um, so, you know, we have, unfortunately, we have far more of those conversations than we do success stories. Like, for instance, Kara Winger, you know, and her achievements in, in recent past, you know, she was a development athlete at one point. Um, Shantae, the year that she jumped in Rio and was one jump away from gold in the high jump, was development that year because it was before the enlightenment came as far as women's pregnancies and mm-hmm. supporting them. That didn't exist back in 2015 t- into 2016. She just had one of her children. And so development was kind of the social safety net mm-hmm. that provided her with support that she could access because she had fallen out of the tears otherwise. Mm-hmm. So we, we fill a lot of different roles. And, you know, it, it, I mean, I hope this conversation goes a little bit of the distance in explaining who we are and what we're trying to do. But unfortunately, we have conversations with athletes who don't understand. And then when you're explaining it, it almost sounds like you're defending the process against a bad decision when that's really not the case. We're all legit right. people. We all want the best for everybody. If we had more money, we'd give more money out. And you know, we're trying. We're all volunteers. Nobody's paying us in our roles as volunteer chair people in our committees and our actions. Um, but... It, it's 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 really hard and it's really sad at sometimes to have to tell somebody we're not telling you you have to give up the dream we're just telling you that we can't support you financially over this other person and again we don't compare individuals by name right i'm speaking in a generality right right any so, favorite feel good stories um Fe- yeah well like i said uh, you know kara is a great story um uh, our, I'm going to mispronounce her name, so I'm not going to say it. Our lady that that, that won the disc in Worlds uh, Lard- was was oh, a former. <laughs> she's a former development athlete. Yeah, I didn't I mean, know that. We have people that make it through. And, right. You know, unfortunately, we'd like the percentage to increase, and we'd like to find a way to accelerate that process. But we do have people that that break out and and make it through, and they're the, you know people that need that opportunity to just get to that moment. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's amazing. So not. Not only Dave the dream crusher, but Dave the dream supporter as well, <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, it's not all bad news. It's not all bad news. Well, we appreciate your commitment to the development of our athletes and in, in the variety of events of the events, excuse me, that we offer in the sport. And um, you've you've done a great service in um, sticking around the sport and serving the sport through coaching, through your coaching stint, and also you know through, uh, you know, leaving and returning to the committee of which you serve such uh, a great tenure. So we thank you for your time and joining us on the podcast, Mr. Karen, and we appreciate your continuous contributions. And uh, we look forward to you developing more athletes. And I definitely will be uh, bending your ear in email uh, (laughs) in hopes of making some improvements in these event areas for sure. Anybody that wants to contact us on any particular question or to make a case for an individual athlete, uh, we're wide open to any suggestions. Please. I'm going to challenge you to a game of horse at some point. You'd be surprised. I heard you got man. a burner on you. <laughs> <Surprised>. <laughs> Flamethrower on your shoulder. Dave Karen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.